I'm going to speak today a little bit about the contemporary management of iliofemoral DVT um, because this is something that we see a fair amount of and the recommendations for treatment have sort of changed rather recently. Uh, so basically we're going to talk just briefly about iliofemoral DVT in general, um, talk a little bit about imaging which I'm sure all of you are much more knowledgeable about than I am. Uh, talk about a little bit about post-thrombotic syndrome and sort of understand what kind of options we have to treat iliofemoral DVT these days. So this is a patient of mine. She's 50 years old. Um, she came to the emergency room with a three-day history of left leg swelling and pain. Uh, she has a history of having rotator cuff surgery approximately three weeks prior to coming to the emergency room. And she put herself on bed rest after that for about three weeks and really didn't do much. She has no previous history of any clots. And when she came to the ER, she looked like this. And this is actually the picture that one of the residents took to send to me to show me what this lady looked like. Um, so obviously, you know, we want to know what her diagnosis is. And our presumed diagnosis is that she has a DVT. And indeed, she did have a lower extremity venous duplex, which showed that she had pretty extensive DVT from the popliteal vein all the way up. So DVT is something that we all know about. It's emphasized to us from medical school all the way up. Um, it's quite common. Relatively speaking, it's estimated there are about 900,000 cases in the United States every year. And it's a source of significant morbidity and mortality. It's not nearly as dramatic or as sexy as arterial disease, but there is a lot of it. Um, in the patients who have symptomatic DVTs, up to 80% of them have radiographic evidence of PE. So that is something that's a little bit worrisome. And up to 80% of patients with DVTs also may have long-term problems with things like post-thrombotic syndrome which if you actually look at the numbers, this leads to 400,000 to 500,000 patients who have leg ulcers. Um, hopefully none of you have to treat a lot of leg ulcers. We treat a fair number of them and it's, it's very painful for both us and the patients. Um, a little science, obviously DVTs are, come from like an imbalance in Virchow's triad, which is stasis of flow, endothelial damage, and a hypercoagulable state. And those, we think those three things together are sort of what lead to thrombosis. In a more scientific way, this is what happens. I'm not going to go through this because nobody really wants to do that, but we all know this is the coagulation cascade. However, what we do know is that for a long time, uh, the mainstay of medical therapy has been anticoagulation. And I remember clearly when I was in residency taking many consult phone calls about this patient is a DVT, this patient is a DVT. Well, I was a surgical resident. We said, well, that's nice. Put them on Coumadin. You know, there's nothing that we do about that. Put them on Coumadin. You know, give them heparin. Give them Coumadin. There's nothing to do. Um, the most recent guidelines, the short version is that for proximal DVT, which we consider to be above the knee, they have to be anticoagulated for at least six months. And for caffeine DVT, and this is a little bit more recent, that we recommend three months of anticoagulation. The older guidelines did not recommend any sort of anticoagulation for caffeine DVT, but that's changed because we saw some propagation of the caffeine DVTs more proximally. We like to sub supplement these things with compression to try to manage the swelling. I'm not entirely sure what these people are doing, but this is a, the picture on the box of the compression socks and leg elevation. However, there is this common misconception uh, that probably starts way back in medical school that anticoagulating the patient actually dissolves the clots, and that is not true. It is the body's own fibrinolytic system that dissolves the clots, it recanalizes the veins, and the only thing that the anticoagulants do is it actually prevents propagation of more clots. So what happens to these patients' DVTs? Um, what we know is that patients who have large burdens of thrombus are more likely to have uh, radiographic evidence of persistent DVT even after their complete course of anticoagulation is done. The presence of uh, residual thrombus is associated with an increased risk of having another DVT. More extensive DVTs are associated with more long-term complications, which is probably not surprising to anyone. So if you have more extensive DVT, you get destruction of the venous valves, and this can lead to venous reflux, venous insufficiency, and ultimately the post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, so knowing this, the most recent ACCP guidelines actually recommend a strategy of thrombus removal for acute iliofemoral DVTs. So obviously the iliac veins and the femoral veins are quite large. So if you have extensive iliofemoral DVT, your thrombus burden is significant. And so the ACCP actually recommends if the patients are, um, can tolerate it to, to try to pursue a strategy of thrombus removal. There are multiple studies that have been done that show that thrombus removal improves the venous valve function in the long term and overall patency of the veins. 
and catheter-directed thrombolysis is preferred. There was a time when we tried to do systemic thrombolysis. There were what we felt to be an unreasonable and unacceptable number of bleeding complications from systemic thrombolysis. And now that we have the technology to do catheter-directed thrombolysis, this is actually what's recommended. Also, it's important to adjunctively treat any underlying venous stenoses or webs, things like that, with angioplasty and stenting as we see it. Um, so what does the DVT actually do to the veins? So obviously normal blood flow, blood should flow from distal to proximal and the veins should close when the blood tries to go the other way and prevent retrograde flow of the veins. When you have a clot in the veins, you not only have the clot, but you also have an inflammatory process that, that occurs. The vein itself becomes leaky, the valve becomes leaky, and the valves get destroyed or stenotic, and uh, you, the veins no longer function the way they ought to. And this is sort of what leads to this swelling, pain, redness, and all the uh, badness down the road. The post-thrombotic syndrome is the classically described long-term complication of venous insufficiency, uh, which is swelling, you can get fatigue with exertion, there's a uh, condition called venous claudication, which is pain with exertion, but instead of the crampy pain that people, the patients report with arterial claudication, most of the patients describe a bursting sensation and they feel their leg is very swollen and they feel that the muscles will burst. You can get venous stasis skin changes, um, ulcers, and the post-thrombotic syndrome is three times more common with more proximal or central DVTs than with more peripheral DVTs. So iliofemoral DVT is much more likely to give patients the post-thrombotic syndrome. This is what it looks like in the actual patients. Um, you can have ulcers, skin changes, and, as, and chronic swelling, as you can imagine. Not only are the patients not very happy about this, but it's very morbid for them. So how do we diagnose DVT? Well, everybody said ultrasound. And ultrasound is a great way to diagnose DVT, and it's excellent for DVT in the leg, so be below the groin crease or distal to the, um, the, the common femoral vein. Uh, as you can see here, when you do an ultrasound of the femoral vein, it should compress. All venous structures should compress. If it does not, there is a problem with the vein. Um, in this particular image, you can also see the clot actually within the femoral vein. Um, also notably, the presence of a common femoral vein thrombus is highly suggestive of something more centrally. So even if you can't see the iliac veins, if you have a thrombus in the common femoral vein, you should be very suspicious that there's something higher up. Because frequently the patient looks like this, and it's very difficult to ultrasound the iliac veins in somebody who's this big. Other things that we can do if we really need to have a look at the iliac veins, you could do CT venogram, which is basically a venous phase CAT scan. Um, you can do MR venogram. There are a variety of ways, contrast enhanced, uh, time of flight, and all of you know much more about MRI than I do, so I'm just going to leave that at that. And ultimately, the gold standard is contrast venography. So this is somebody who has a common iliac vein DVT. As you can see from sort of the image that they you have this alteration in the contrast density and sort of that feathery appearance of the vein, which is consistent with thrombus. So what about this patient, this lady who came to the, the emergency room? So what do we do for her? Uh, we took her to the operating room, actually, to try to take care of her clots. Um, we did uh, transpalpateal vein access under ultrasound. And the only reason I bring this up is this is a picture of a, th of a palpateal vein that actually has a thrombus in it. So if the thrombus is relatively recent and the clot is reasonably soft, you can go ahead and try to puncture the popliteal vein even if there is a clot in it. Um, you just have to keep in mind that you will probably not be able to aspirate blood from the vein. And so you, know, you have to really see the point of the needle go into the vein and watch the wire go up under ultrasound or under fluoroscopy because you may not actually be able to aspirate, aspirate blood. But if you can visualize the vein pretty well and it's, it's relatively easy to pass the wire, you can go ahead and stick the vein even if there's a clot in it. This is her initial venogram. So this is her, uh, we actually put her prone because we had access to popliteal veins. So in this case, her left side is also our left side. You can see there's quite a bit of clot in the iliac veins here. We went ahead and did mechanical thrombectomy, which is one of the many. Because she was uh, prone. She was prone. Mm -hmm. yeah, the yeah. Right, so you can see um, left is over here as our left. So the usual reversal that we're used to when we look at films, we've reversed the reversal, which is very confusing to us when we go back and look at the films, but she is prone. 
So we went ahead and we did mechanical thrombectomy. We have the angiogel thrombectomy device in the operating room here. Um, if you guys ever need it, that's where it is. You can come to the vascular suite and pick it up. Um, and what this does is it both uh, sprays saline and aspirates at the same time. So it should mechanically break up the clots and then aspirate any of the residual debris. Um, it has a very, very low incidence of distal embolization, so it's actually quite good for this. It works really well in clots that are less than two weeks old. So once you get past about 14 days, you know, the clots start to organize, and the angiojet probably does not work as well. Um, it, it does work some, and it's probably worth trying if you really need to, but you won't get the same results if the clots are more than two weeks old. But we did this for her because she'd only been like this for about three days. We also ran some thrombolysis overnight. So this is something that we have available to us now, which we didn't a while back. Um, thrombolysis actually does dissolve clots. So this is the medicine that dissolves clots, not the anticoagulants. Uh, to do this, you have to basically sit a side hole catheter in the thrombus and run the thrombolysis on a pump overnight. And in, in our hospital, you have to go to the ICU for that. So I mean, it's, it's quite a bit of legwork to get this done. This is what she looked like after about 24 hours of thrombolysis after we'd done some angiojet and we'd let the lysis go overnight. And so you can see that it doesn't look great, but there is a lumen there now where there used to be just a lot of clots. So we actually went ahead, we angioplastied her quite a bit. And uh, in the end, you can see higher up, she looks a little bit better. This is actually the angiojet catheter here, these two little marks, that's what it looks like. And we put in a kissing iliac vein stents because I had to stent her on the left side all the way up. Remember again, she's prone. So this is her left side, this is her right side. And so you can see sort of as the stents were deployed, there's a narrowing right here. And so we actually put some stents in. And in the end, this is what she looked like. Uh, we actually called her today at home. She's feeling much better. She has no leg swelling and she's pretty happy. On further questioning, when I saw her in the hospital, she also admitted a chronic history of painless le left leg swelling, which had been occurring for years which no one had been able to get out of her, probably because they didn't know to ask. And so, in fact, what this lady actually had is May-Turner syndrome, um, which May-Turner is a syndrome where you actually get compression of the left common iliac vein from the right common iliac artery. So you can see this is a patient who obviously is supine, but this is a series of images actually from a paper where they treated the May-Turner syndrome. So there's a lot of collateralization in the pelvis because the iliac vein is actually occluded. They went ahead, they angioplasty this, they stented it, they restored flow in the, uh, the traditional sense, and all the pelvic collaterals ceased to fill. So compression or stenosis of the iliac vein, really of any of the central veins, will also significantly increase your DVT risk. I don't see any of the nephrologists here, but um, we see a lot of central stenosis in the nephrology patients in the upper extremities from their dialysis catheters and things like that, and that definitely does make their thrombus risk go up. Um, so phlegmasia. Phlegmasia is probably the worst presentation of acute DVT. Um, you can have phlegmasia cerulea dolens or blue color, or phlegmasia alba dolens or white color, also called the milk leg. So this is very worrisome if somebody comes in. It looks like this. I've definitely seen it. It's not very common, but we see it sometimes. And this leg, it's a little hard to say, but you can see it's clearly not as purple as the leg on the left, and it is significantly swollen compared to the leg on the right. So if you see these people, they need something done to get their thrombus removed in an expeditious fashion because then they can progress to things like this, which are venous gangrene. And somebody who has venous gangrene will lose the limb just like arterial gangrene. So we would prefer never to see anybody who looks like this. Um, if you need to remove clots in an expeditious fashion, in addition to endovascular options with a, a mechanical thrombectomy and thrombolysis, you can do operative thrombectomy, which is what we had available to us for a while. Um, so basically here, you can either do this percutaneously, we would probably do it open, we cut down on the groins, we actually find the vein. This is the cava here, I'm not sure why it's red, but it is the cava. And you actually put some Fogarty balloons up and you can actually pull the clots out of the cava through the femoral veins. If you need to get the clots out of the leg, this is more for, I think, the one surgical resident who's here, um, you can use the Esmark bandage, which is basically the big elastic bandage. We all know it because the cardiac surgeons like to wrap the leg with it when they do a bypass. But it's very this really stretchy elastic bandage, much tighter than an ACE wrap. And you start the patient's toes, and you wrap them very tightly from their toes all the way up to the groin. And you cut down on the femoral vein, and the whole clot squeezes out of the vein like a tube of toothpaste and you end up with something that looks like this. 
So we don't do that very often, but if you really need to get the clot out of the leg, it's hard to pass a Fogarty because you're going against the valves, and so this is the way to do it. Um, I'm gonna finish briefly with a word of caution about IVC filters, because IVC filters, we historically, in, in recent history, there have been a lot of IVC filters placed. I think they are falling out of favor to some extent, um, but please keep in mind that IVC filters are an intravascular foreign body, and intravascular foreign bodies are thrombogenic in and of themselves. This is a patient of mine who had an IVC filter placed three years ago prophylactically after a major trauma. It was appropriately indicated. He had a big pelvic fracture and he couldn't be anticoagulated. He's quite a large man, so um, I think the filter was well indicated, but he came to me with a year of progressively worsening lower extremity swelling bilaterally, uh, very severe to the point where he had to quit his job. He actually, he works the produce section in a, in a Brookshire's and he was unable to work anymore. So he's also prone, we did a bilateral transpopliteal vein accesses on him, and this is his femoral vein here, which is not normal. You would expect it to be much larger than that and the contour to be much better. And this is actually what he looks like up in the pelvis, and this is the culprit right here. This is his IVC filter, which I believe he has a, I think it's a trapeze, so they put in a permanent filter in this man. Um, and so his entire cava is thrombosed. So, we don't get these patients very often, but once in a while we do see them, and it's pretty significant when they come to us. So you can see he barely has any flow through his iliac vein here. Um, I don't know if I have a picture of the other side. We shot contrast up the other side. It looks pretty similar. You can see contrast does not go in the cava. It, in fact, goes over the confluence of the iliac veins down the other leg because this is completely occluded. Um, fortunately for him, we were actually able to pass a wire through this filter and get the catheter up through the filter and the um, the cava around the renals and higher up was actually patent. So we did some angioplasty, some stenting, we ran the angiojet, and we lysed this guy with a lot of lytic overnight and brought him back. And so I don't think you can see the filter in this picture, it's probably up here somewhere. Um, but you can see that he's actually much better. He doesn't look good by any stretch, but he does look significantly better. So that being said, we lysed him for another 24 hours. And then he looked like this. And so I think you can see a little bit here is the filter hereabouts. So you can see that the, the filter which was occluded, that started to open up. You can see the cava up here is open. Here again, the cava on the other side, here's the top of the filter. So we have some flow. Um, we thought we were still making some progress, so we lysed him for another day. And then uh, 72 hours later, this is what we had. You know, 72 hours after we started. If you're going to run thrombolysis for patients with clots, whether they're arterial or venous, three days is about all you have. Most of the time they're done in one or two days, but you really shouldn't go past 72 hours. You risk your bleeding complications goes up significantly. So things like massive GI bleeds, intracranial bleeds, things like that. So you gotta work within your three day window. But um, this guy, he doesn't look any different to me when I see him in the clinic, but he says he feels much better and he's able to walk and go back to work and things like that. So. You know, I, I wish that he had had a retrievable filter that had been removed, which he did not, um, but we, we were lucky that we were able to actually open this up. There are some centers that will describe if you have an IVC filter, which is uh, thrombosed, if you can lice them open, they will actually take a balloon and crush the filter up against the walls of the cava. So that's an option. I think you have a patient that you're gonna do that too. Um, so they can actually try to fracture the filter and actually crush the filter up against the wall to, to uh, eliminate the obstruction. But as you can imagine, that is a little bit risky, and uh, it would be a lot better if they just didn't have the filter in the first place. So the reason I bring this guy up is because for those of you putting in IVC filters, please, 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 if the patient does not need a permanent filter, don't put a permanent filter in and take it out when they're done. Um, from a resident standpoint, it's kind of fun. From a patient standpoint, you can prevent a lot of morbidity down the road. Also, the studies that have been done that on occluded cavas associated with IVC filters, the biconical filters of the trapeze and the optes are significantly more likely to thrombose the cava than the Greenfield style umbrella filters. So they're easy to put in, the sort of the double basket filters, but they are associated with more caval thrombosis. So it's something to keep in mind. So basically, in summary, a DVT is associated with significant mortality and morbidity. The strategy of thrombus removal should be considered in patients with massive iliofemoral DVT because this can actually prevent their complications of things like 
uh, DVT recurrence and post-thrombotic syndrome. We have surgical and endovascular options. Uh, the general consensus these days is the endovascular options are probably better. Uh, so that's good for all of you because um, surgery is not the option for most of you. So these patients may show up to see, to see some of you. Um, the only caveat with the endovascular options is you gotta make sure that the patients can actually be lysed. So there are a bunch of contraindications to thrombolysis. So obviously if your patients had major surgery, they're at risk for bleeding, you know, they've had some, something, they've had a fall and some sort of intracranial trauma, those guys cannot get thrombolysis. But if you can give them thrombolysis, ultimately they seem to do better. Um, and IVC filters, they're very helpful in the appropriately selected patients, but if you, they can be taken out, please do so, because you can prevent a lot of morbidity down the road. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? The case you showed is a case for us. All of those cases are on here. Yeah, those are both cases from LSU. I've seen a lot of patients with DVT associated with the intervena. Um, you been here? You've been here how many years? Now? I've been here two and a half years. How many cases So I've seen, I think total, I think I've seen four occluded cavas. Um, yes, but the conclusion of the cava can be related to the thrombus. Mm -hmm. That was caused by the filter, and the filter did a good job. Right. See, because that is the, 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 the conundrum there, mm -hmm. you know? No, for sure. Yeah, on the other hand, one of the things that you both have talked about, two topics, that we do not integrate in the discussions. Right. You know, the fact of prevention, you know, we're talking about what we do after the fact. You know, the, the jar is broken. Okay, now we put it together. Mm -hmm. Now we put it together, and it's never going to be the same. Right. But we don't talk about, for instance, the patient that has a filter or the patient that has a treatment. How can we prevent, you know, especially before they get any problems, the DVT, mm -hmm. or what to do after you do your uh, angioplasty and thrombectomy or whatever, and, and do the same thing. Well, I think, is, I think in the case of the IVC filter, um, I, I think, Two or three out of the four patients that I've seen with thrombose cavas, their filters were put in prophylactically. Yeah, but so, so I think in those patients, really, it's the timely removal of a temporary filter when they can be anticoagulated that's key, because they had no existing thrombus when their filter was placed. It was sort of placed prophylactically. Again, the patient that, that I showed you, I think his prophylactic filter, he was appropriately selected for that. I mean, he definitely you know, he's an obese man who had a major trauma who couldn't be anticoagulated and was immobile from his pelvic fracture. I think he was appropriately selected. Um, however, you know, we work with the orthopedic surgeons here, the trauma surgeons, and you know, there are definitely times when they say, if we want to do a surgery, please put a filter in. We can't anticoagulate the patient. But two days after, if they're fine from their surgery, you can start them on a DVT prophylaxis, like chemoprophylaxis. And so we'll wait until they've had that for a couple of days, make sure they don't bleed and take the filters out. Um, but, but I agree with you that the, the situation where the, um, where the filter is full of thrombus, and that's a different animal. And you know, that means that the filter is working, first of all. It's done its job. It's captured the clots. And uh, we all know that you cannot take out a filter that's full of clots. I mean, that's, that cannot be removed. So. Another thing is, for instance, the patient that you've seen with the curve, with the thrombus, mm -hmm. were they people that were in their move or were they or something? But they definitely have risk factors for DVT. I mean, in the LSU population, almost everybody is obese. They're not the most mobile. But, but, but that's what I'm saying. When we talk about these cases, we as physicians need to think about the whole process, not the single thing what we can do when we have cancer. You know? But sure, what can we do for people not to develop this problem? You know, and how about we prevent it? When the patient should be encouraged to eat the patient, okay diet that prevents high viscosity in blood, mm -hmm. you know, exercise, and all the stuff. But what I'd like to touch uh, is other aspects of the disease process that unless we control the disease process, these things, you know, they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. And our results are going to be very difficult. You know, if the patient that you do recanalize a uh, uh, you know, uh, or, uh, 
and the lower extremity uh, arterial disease. Continue smoking, sitting down, you know, having coffee, something like that. That guy, you know, is going to be. You know. I can't speak for my partners, but the claudicators, if they smoke, I won't fix them. Yeah. I tell them flat out, I will not fix you if you continue yeah. to smoke. But I think it's, it's yeah. logical. It's kind of touching their self responsibility for what's happening. Uh, one other thing I, would, I did want to bring up is that there are some people who uh, question if you should place a filter if you're going to lice, because presumably you're going to break up all those clots, you know, if you're going to lice the cave and things like that. There's really no data that says that you have to. Um, it's sort of your own feeling as a physician if you feel comfortable lysing them without the filter or not. Um, the general consensus, I think, is that if there's a free-floating thrombus in the cave, I think most of us would put a filter in for that. Uh, beyond that, it's really up to you if you feel like that would be helpful or not. And, and the people that do prophylactically place filters for lysis, typically they'll go through a jugular approach, they'll put in a temporary filter, they'll lyse, and when then they're done lysing, they'll come back, they'll take the filter out, as long as you have a resolution of the clots. That was a good question. So that, that's a little, it's a little controversial, but that's, in a, in a broad sense, that's kind of the answer as we see it right now. Two wonderful complexions. Okay, wonderful, very, very educational. Thank you so much.